my dad needed Jesus just as much as I did. So I stopped looking at him as a father and more as a sinner, just like me. So I could actually start talking to him with that. So, so we got to talking about how you could know that you could have your salvation, which was it last no, 2021, which he passed. He was in the hospital. We had to do these Zoom calls because the cool. restrictions and stuff. But like an hour prior to him dying, I I got was a uh, able to ask him like, Dad, do you know where you're going when you die? Like, do you know that? Jesus Christ is the only way to enter heaven, like, mm-hmm. through his blood. And he's like, yes, I know that. So okay. I take comfort in that, but yeah, it's between yeah. him and God. It's Welcome to A Light of the Gospel, episode 48. Today I'm speaking with Jake Fast. I actually went to school with his brother Abe way back in the day, so it was neat to uh, reminisce and to catch up a little bit. I didn't know Jake at all until just recently. John Fair, who I had a guest on my recent uh, a recent episode, uh, introduced me to him and said I should really have him on. Jake does have quite a story. He came from a pretty uh, rough home as well, uh, a rough attitude that he had in his childhood and got him into some serious trouble in his teen years and it eventually led him to seek outside of the old colony faith for truth and, uh, and light and hope. And so he found the gospel, or rather Christ found him, and he's been rejoicing ever since. So he's just an ordinary guy like most of us, and he loves the Lord, and he's wanting to serve God as well as he can. So I hope you're blessed and encouraged by this story. Make sure you uh, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I sure appreciate you coming around. conversation as can be on video i know we're still a little bit different because we know it's being recorded yeah. but for it the most part it's like someone feel as intimidating someone's just a fly on the wall right yeah and they can actually hear what people's lives are about without uh, yeah. feeling like it's pre-rehearsed or something like that right? yeah so it's pretty much how old are you i'm 34 today 34 today oh wow it's your birthday <laughs> yeah. how cool is that i know it's interesting yeah so you're born in 88 89 Okay, so you'd know my brother Jamie probably? Yeah, I know who Jamie is. Oh, he's three years younger, I think. We never hung out, but yeah. I know. Yeah. I think I know you the most, but that's because okay. this and then my brother saying that he knows you and Joey. Yeah. I'm guessing I know Joey. A Joe's uh, four years younger than me, so he'd be about uh, three years older than you, I believe. Yeah, because Abe's 40, so Abe's your age, right? I think he's probably just 41 now, right? When was his uh, birthday? It would be June or June. July, okay. Or July. I think I'm sure now. most likely he's 41 because I think he was just a touch hold, older than me. Okay, but maybe he can clarify that for us. I know he uh, commented on my video the other day of John Ferris, so I, I mentioned kind of, that to him and like encouraged him like you should hear it. It's, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, I know my uh, my th- recollection of you guys goes way back to the old colony days at old colony private school and old colony Sunday school. Abe and I would often kind of butt heads and he was a very feisty kind of guy and I had a bit of an attitude thought I was something special maybe who knows what right but ignorant and young and uh, thinking that we're something and uh, he uh, my son asked me today he says is Jake fast uh, or does he run fast right and I said, yeah. actually his brother Abe used to be really fast we always made comment on that right like yeah. last name fast and oh, he yeah. could really run Oh, yeah. Uh, the German translation, Faust, where you're stuck. Oh, yeah, that's the other way of looking the, at it. The aggressive nature, I think it's in our whole family. I find it interesting, and I know this is totally off topic, but that how often the last name of someone actually goes along with the way that they live. Like, you think of Donald Trump. What does he do? He's trumpeting all the time. He's always blurring some message, right? Like, it just fits his, his personality. And there's so many people like that. I've heard people comment on it before, but fast means to, to stay firm right yeah. that's the old the old english word is the same way firm. stand fast yeah. in the lord and so it could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing and that's yeah. that goes for almost all of our giftings right uh, and so you find stubbornness and oh yeah that is a <laughs> pride lot is is pretty normal pride i've been trying to knock down pretty good but i never knew that self-consciousness is a form of pride so when you think little of yourself you think little of god you think you're better than god Okay. So it's a form of pride, so you have to learn to knock that down and be like, it's okay, God, you can use me wherever you want to. Yeah. So that that was my big thing, because I always thought little of myself. I thought I was a nobody. Yeah. So it, it was, I think, only in the last couple of years that I realized that, like, 
thinking little of yourself is a form of pride as well. Yeah. It's funny because people think humility, being humble, is thinking little of yourself. So they'll be like, oh, I see plus notion. Me as the plus notion. I'm just nobody. I, I, give, I don't amount to anything. And then you think that that makes you sound humble. But what it does is it draws more attention to yourself. Yeah. Whereas humility is actually thinking of yourself less. Yeah. So you can, instead of thinking that you're nothing, you just don't think about yourself. You're thinking about somebody else. Yeah. You're thinking about the Lord or thinking about other people. Yeah, and that's what happened in my life. It's like, it's like a 24-7 topic in my head of God, Jesus, what I can do, like where I'm falling short. It's okay. Just, it's like, it always runs through my head anyway. I see. It's, so what was it like growing up? How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have five sisters and an eight for the brother. So Just one brother? Seven of us, okay. yeah. We never really hung out as kids. You and your brother? Yeah, he was, it was a seven-year difference and like different atmospheres, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I would yeah. have two of my sisters that I kind of hung out with, so I would have been uh, playing with dolls and stuff with them, or they would come and do like the boy stuff too. Force you into the girls' play? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... I think I felt felt kind of lonely to be the only boy growing up. Yeah. Because you're like an outcast. So that's literally how I grew up my life, thinking I was an outcast. Because in my mind, I thought, like, I don't belong to this family. I feel like it's not a part of me. Hmm. Which I think is just a lie of Satan puts in people. who are like, yeah, you are nobody. And what is it? I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, I lost. My so that's fine. Um, so, like, going, growing up, you were uh, you lived in this area usually, right? I know your parents lived in Vienna for quite a while. Yeah, we lived on the forty two. Okay. The Lake Lake Shore Road, right, right, Nova Scotia right. line. Yeah. And so you grew up outside a lot, or were you inside quite a bit? On the farm, but so we oh when there was farm work available, we worked on the farm. Okay, from young on, working hard always. Yeah. So, at five, I'd be picking behind the cucumbers already. Oh, at five, five years old. old. Yeah. And then seven, I had my own row. So that was a full time chore then, and things stack up as you go. So you got strawberries, yeah. you got black tobacco, so it's stalks. You do hang, kill hanging. Yeah. You do the curing where you dry it and you bale it. So there's a, we're always busy. Yeah. We're supposed to be busy. Interesting. And Sometimes people wonder why it is that Mennonites all work hard or Amish. And it's not all the case, like especially in our culture now, there's yeah. a lot of lazy young Mennonites too. Uh-huh. But kids that had to work at five and seven, and it's just, it's, you get to the point where it's just like, okay, well, that's just what you do, right? Yeah. You have to. Well, we went to Mexico for the winters then. So my dad's okay. dream was for us to eventually move to Mexico. So he had bought a property there and everything. But I think that dream kind of shut down because time runs away from everybody. Yeah. Kids start getting older. And the one instance where he said, no, we're not going to go over there was when he almost got shot, I guess. In Mexico. Yeah. Okay. So apparently some boy claimed that my dad had scared his girlfriend. So the minute he came to our house, and then he uh, was shouting, get my dad to come out, and then he's like, you scared my girl. So he was high on some kind of drugs or something, the guy. But he had a gun, I'm not sure what the gauge was, but pointed out of his truck at my dad, because my dad had just, with a reflex, quickly grabbed it and bent it up, and as he bent it up, he heard the shot. Yikes. Yeah, so he ended up shooting through his truck. But there he decided it wasn't worth going to Mexico. There's, it's more reckless there, right? People can... I mean, there's some pretty wild kids around here too, but yeah. there's more potential trouble. Yeah, there's, there's more freedom from the law. Over there. Yeah, so less repercussions for things you do there. Mm-hmm. But a lot more deaths too. Than, yeah. yeah. That's interesting because when you look at um, the way that people operate here, sometimes the Mennonites cringe at the thought of raising their kids in Canada because then their kids become worldly. <laughs> They're no longer as old colony-ish. Yeah. But then a lot of the kids that are raised more quote-unquote worldly often don't get into incest and rape and drugs and all that i mean there is plenty of that here too but it seems like in mexico where they can hide from the law the church kind of frowns on it but doesn't really do anything about it and they do it more in like the paraguay and bolivia area my wife's family's in that from that direction okay they do it more there almost it seems yeah Yeah. but yeah you introduce them to the world and they see there's a different light than what you live so that's te- technically what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be given the option. In the end, it's your choice. It's not something that you cram down your someone's throat like the gospel. Mm-hmm. You can say this is who God is. This is what Jesus did, and it's not to be forced on someone's throat. But like these are your options. Mm-hmm. Like you gotta choose who you want to serve. Yeah. Because 
at the end of the time, there's two, two people that God will call. The one that God said to them, your will be done. And the ones that people say to God, your will be done. Right. So. Yeah. But I know and as far as um, raising children goes, a lot of old colony parents didn't really know the gospel. Yeah. But what they did know is the Bible is right. And what the preacher said is right, you know. And so don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this. And that's kind of your whole life. Like, you feel bad if you do something wrong. But other than that, there's no hope, there's no joy, no life. Did you have much thought of that as a ch child, yeah. of doing right and wrong or feeling guilty or bad? Or Yeah, we had, I think the way we got raised is more like a God of fear. So if you do this, then this will happen. So you're going to hell or, and you can only hope that you will go to get, enter heaven. Yeah you gotta do your best so it's based on works which I had to learn myself but it was through Bible studies but through scripture you can see that you can know and that's not of works mm -hmm. the works follow your belief your faith yeah so so yeah. Were, you, were you pretty conscious of God as a young boy already or was it not something that really crossed your mind I was always conscious of God but I never knew what to do with it we didn't really start I guess soul searching is the word but until we were pregnant with our first daughter and then we're like we don't want our daughter's to grow up in a, like a wild world because mm -hmm. when we grew up we had the bunches that they called to go to church on Sunday morning and then after that you go to the bunch mm -hmm. like we didn't want that for our daughter and like it's terrible <laughs> it was pretty bad for yourself even yeah. growing through that teenage years yeah. I never had any close friends so I bounced from group to group kind of mm -hmm. and it's usually with an older group and then there was usually plenty of trouble to yeah with my anger came a lot of trouble as well. <laughs> all that too right? yeah so is that kind of a defining feature of your childhood and teens, anger, you think? I think so. Yeah. Abe, Abe always struck me as a very angry guy. I don't want to talk about him un unduly, <laughs> yeah. but I remember back then he, he would have a pretty quick temper. Oh, that's, it comes from our family. My dad was like that. My grandpa was like that. Very quick tempered. It sucks. It's our own undoing. Yeah. We get so mad that we stumble over, over ourselves pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it gets you in a lot of trouble because I ended up... I guess almost killing a guy through that anger. Really? Yeah. Back in the days, we used to go to the, like, I think it was Norma Jeans in Tilsonburg because of that bar. Okay. So, we're, so we was in your teenage years? It was like 19, 18, 19, yeah. We were, went to the motel uh, just up the hill in Tilsonburg. So we were walking there. And some vehicle the, just by the T intersection was yelling obscenities at us and just vulgar language. And us being young and egotistic whatever you want to call yeah, it yeah. we're like what what are you gonna do they stop climb out of the vehicle and they come down to fight us so the guy starts swinging but he did like a wide swing it just out of instinct just went straight through into his jaw and knocked him right out and later on i got told i broke his jaw in two places i popped his uh eardrum and they're like that guy almost died like he almost killed him like it was Crazy. on the verge of popping the brain and if that was the case, then he would be dead and I would be serving life behind bars. Just one hit? One hit. And they don't call it restraint. They said, because you can hit that hard, it's your fault. It doesn't matter who started it. Interesting. So I found out how the system works a little bit like Was that. there any fines involved? Yeah. I ended up going to a lawyer, but it ended up being a $700 fine. And then I ended up getting a summary. What was it? An aggravated assault causing bodily harm with a deadly weapon. What? Yep. And they based it on a summary conviction because, I don't know what it was, but they called it a summary conviction. So I wouldn't do, serve any time, but it's on my record for, for life. Wow. So. Yeah, that can change your life real quick all of a sudden. It's just a, a, a moment of uh, egotistical, like you said, uh, bravado, where like I'm tougher than you are, and you get the right hit, he comes in, and boom, that's your whole world can change. Well, it made me realize that <laughs> there's always someone tougher and... It won't get you nowhere. The like, it's gonna get you in a jail cell. That's what it. Yeah. Which, if you're that kind of a person, then you'd probably be better off in that setting. Interesting, but it's it kind of goes to show you too that a lot of people, let's say they end up in jail or they end up being a murderer or a drug dealer, it it's not like you could spot them always before. It's not like they were this guy that was just trying to constantly make trouble. Sometimes they're just kind of on the brink of trouble. Someone can be proud and egotistical and just kind of uh, full of bravado and full of, um, you know, the zest of life and even testosterone, just want to go. And then some one little thing can happen and all of a sudden their whole life is now like, am I really a criminal? I never thought of myself as a criminal. I was just having fun and being, being cool and yeah. stuff like that, right? 
And so did that did that change the direction of your life at all, or was it just kind of a blip it on definitely everything? changed the direction of my life. I wanted something different. I didn't want to live that life. Like I had a roommate. He was a drug dealer. Did you drugs. weren't living at home. I got kicked out at seventeen. Okay. So that's another story. So it, it's a funny thing is rules religion they we had gone swimming i had come back with shorts and that's a big no-no for my dad when he's not in a good mood so he got all up my face about it and basically i had enough I, it was two different instances that happened but the one that i had enough and i just left for good was he grabbed me but somehow i grabbed him back and i ended up throwing him because i was under the in, uh, under the thought that i had to become stronger and bigger than to not fear him anymore hmm. So, I think I shocked him that I had more strength than he thought I did. But wow, it wasn't good. And that's not a good place to be in, right? Where your dad should never be someone that you feel the need to to bring down. But it is often the case when, especially if a dad is very hard and kind of difficult to please, then the sons often will be like, "You just wait." Oh, well, the other instance where my dad kicked me out, it was over. I think he had found a. I was playing the PlayStation at a PlayStation in my room. I found the TV there and found that I could watch TV on it. That made him really mad. PlayStation was okay, but TV was... No, it's all not okay. Oh, okay. I was trying to hide it. Yeah. So I couldn't read books. I got spent disciplined for that. I couldn't play that. I would get disciplined for that. But my dad being mad at me for the, the other time, which would be the first time, I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. So not that I was going to do it, but I got a knife out. I'm like, if you hate me that much, I'm like, might as well end my life here. But I knew I couldn't do it, so I handed him the, the knife, and I'm like, you know what, you do it. Like, like, you can end your misery. Like, I create that much misery in you. But that's heartbreaking for a father to see still, yeah. even in that state. But I thought I was smart doing it. <laughs> so your your childhood was kind of defined by all of that, where, especially during your teenage years, a lot of anger in the home and mm-hmm. never being able to quite please him, and you probably purposely trying to upset him. I tried to avoid him. Oh, okay. So... I was scared of his anger, so I tried to avoid him. Yeah. And I don't know. The defining moments would be defined in discipline, or we we do remember the traveling back and forth. So there's a lot of good memories there too. Yeah. But for some reason, the negative always outshines the positive. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. So it was pretty pretty rough relationship with your dad. How about with your mom? It wasn't much of one. We just worked together because the field work, but I yeah. can't say that I was very close with them, especially for not having lived or being around them for two years after getting kicked out. I have a very hard, very hard time communicating with them. Okay. Right now, I would say I probably have the closest relationship with Abe, which is surprising. <laughs> nice. And uh, basically, uh, it feels cold. It feels it feels like we didn't have love. Mm. I, I'm sure that's not what they thought they were doing but to me it felt like the love wasn't there that for the children yeah so. it's the crazy thing about some of that is is very likely your dad's dad was also a very hard man maybe even abusive who knows right yeah. and it just kind of gets passed on that the, the next guy doesn't really know what to do and so the only reason you can think at all differently now is because god intervened right yeah. something happened in your life where it broke that cycle hopefully well and that doesn't have to be that way with your kids. That's exactly it. It's like I didn't want that because you fear the kids. For me, what big uh, revelation, whatever you would call, was in the scripture stuff. I realized my my dad needed Jesus just as much as I did. So I stopped looking at him as a father and more as a sinner, just like me. Mm-hmm. In need. And you could have Jesus. compassion on him. Yeah. So I could actually start talking to him with that. So. It was very nice through that. At times it sounded, well, we talk very loud. Before the hearing aids, it sounded like a shouting match normally. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so you guys all had some hearing trouble? Or yeah, just you? It's it's a genetic thing. Okay. I think most of us have it. Some of them don't, but most of us do. Interesting. And so we got to talking about how you could know that you could have your salvation, which was it last, no, 2021, which he passed. He was in the hospital. We had to do these Zoom calls because the cool. restrictions and stuff. Like an hour prior to him dying, I I got was a uh, able to ask him like, Dad, do you know where you're going when you die? Like, do you know that Jesus Christ is the only way to enter heaven? Like, mm-hmm. through His blood. And he's like, Yes, I know that. So, okay. 
I take comfort in that, but yeah, it's between yeah. him and God. It's but not. like before he got sick, before all that, you guys didn't really have a, a way to get back in good relationship. Not really. Yeah. Like we tried at times, but it was very hard. So it's like a curtain between us or something. Yeah, but now knowing what you know about uh, forgiveness and love and all that, you hopefully there's no like long term bitterness in your I don't heart. Know. Um, I don't have the bitterness. Now it's a story that I can grow from. Yes. Yeah. No, and let's say realize that he's just as lost as anybody else is in this world. Mm -hmm. That you feel sorry for them more than you do hate them. Yeah. So. Yeah, that seems to be the case, right? I know um, each of us comes with our own sense of struggles, right? Maybe uh, your parents couldn't get a hold of certain things in your their life, so then you have the same issues in your own life. And I've had people sometimes say, like one of my guys I used to work for. He said, man, you never get angry. You never, like, it's not really a temptation for me. Yeah. Like, I, I don't struggle with it. It's not something where that's the thing I have to fight. Yeah. It's not a big struggle. Whereas for him, like, you know, if he got upset, you better watch out. Something's going to come flying across the room, right? Exactly. And um, I had my own struggles. And it maybe wasn't as apparent to him. But it doesn't make me superior because I don't struggle with anger. Yeah. Although, sometimes men especially seem to justify anger because it seems like a manly trait. Yeah. And there is a way to use anger to get things done. But someone who flies off the handle, who can't control their anger, is just an emotional man, right? Yeah, exactly. We sometimes think of men aren't emotional, but if you can't contain your anger... You're and emotional. You, yeah, you're a very emotional person, right? I had to find out that I am an emotional person, too. Yeah. Because anger is emotion. If you have anger, you have that sadness and the, the vulnerable feeling just as well. Yeah. And You cover somebody, it up with yeah. rage. Somebody put it this way to me, where uh, anger is, there also lies lust. So anger and lust tie in hand in hand. So you're saying that traits that you had to try to break, or for God to basically basically take from you, to be the anger and lust tying in hand in hand, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you don't get angry, but you get angry less and you don't get the fit of rage. Yeah. But we shouldn't anyway. I did, I guess this, just this year I did that again, which I hadn't done for years, but... That, yeah, I mean, the tendencies can come back just like any addict, right? You think of John Fair, who we both know, yeah. and the, the ability to go back into drugs is still with him. Mm -hmm. Like, he could do it, but it's a renewing of the mind and recognizing who he is in Christ, right? Yeah. It took a bit to uh, get to the anger point, but once it was there, it was like, yeah, I don't like this. Yeah. I got off of the anger very quick, but... It's a feeling it, that you remember it, almost, eh? Yeah, you do remember it. And it, it engulfs you. It ruins your day. It yeah. absolutely just destroys your day. Yeah. So it makes you moody and sullen. And <laughs> yeah. And then the people who suffer the most are the ones who are closest to you, right? Your wife or your children. And yeah. Yeah. They get the repercussions of that. Yeah. Because. So maybe take us back. You were seventeen. You moved out. You got into this trouble with the law. You're living with a roommate that wasn't any much good as far as influence goes. Yeah. Um, you met your wife during that period of time probably? I was dating her before that. I met her at 16. Okay. So she got to experience me getting kicked out. It was her family that actually helped me with uh, finding a place to sleep for a bit. So we cr I crashed at their house for a little bit. Okay. And then they uh, they're doing asparagus at the time and my job was slow. So they took me in to allow me to cut asparagus with them. So kind of paid the bills. I found a Different roommate was actually pretty nice, but we didn't talk much. It was on Lakeshore Road, just some house. I rented a room, spent some time there, so bounced around a bit. And, but it was two years with my roommate that in Tulsenburg where we were living. Okay. And then my brother-in-law bought, had bought in a duplex in Stratfordville. I didn't want to live with that lifestyle anymore, so I moved to my brother-in-law's, uh, one part of the duplex, and from there... When did you finally get married? That's bad. <laughs> um, it's 10 years ago, February. It'll be 10 years ago. Okay. So, 04? Okay. To, uh, 14. 14, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 14, 14, 2014. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And we got married in the old colony because we didn't know any better. We you, weren't, really... you weren't really attending church, though? No. We. Well, I'm selfish, but it was cheap. So I was trying to go as cheap as possible, then I can afford the honeymoon. Yeah. So that's what I did. We tried attending the church, but we kept getting uh, hammered as to why we shouldn't. Instances being like, 
when you're doing the communion, they're asking that you don't have any stubble or a woman shouldn't have a white sock. Um, you, things that make no sense. So if you, like you obviously grow a thick, full beard pretty quickly, it looks like, so you had to keep that shave really clean all the time. Ah, uh, I still have stubble, but yeah. my wife likes it, so I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. But at the old colony, it was pretty strict, some of those things where you get it, frowned upon. Oh, I did. You get frowned upon, but I wasn't in, I didn't really care what people really thought. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, you got married, what age, what age were you then? As 10 years ago, you were 24? 23. 23. Okay. I got married in 23. Yeah. So you spent quite a few years. Two years you said you moved out and then you moved back in with your parents or no? I never moved back Never then. moved back then. No. Yeah, it was like a split. Like, it's like we didn't belong to the same family kind of feeling. Mm. It just feels a disconnect. Yeah. We ended up doing a Bible study in 2015. We started, I think it was, with, uh, it was our neighbors in Stratford at the time. My brother-in-law, they were doing a Bible study with them already. We just asked if we could join because we wanted to know more about what the Bible has to say for us. You were already married with the children or a child We or were two? expecting okay. the child. So. And all through all that, we wanted better for our child. Yeah. So we just started the Bible study. Well, actually, first we did a Bible study with uh, some friends, but they were expecting and they wanted to focus on their family more, which already piqued their interest. And we liked the community that a group provides. And then we went to a different one, I think, they're called the, the Patents from Vienna. Oh, yeah. A lot of people know them, but we did Bible study with them, I think, like eight or nine years. But it's a lot of knowledge that they taught us. We kind of went our own ways now, because we got involved with uh, Lighthouse in Port Burwell. So I just told them that we wanted to grow in our church more, be part of our church, because we're called to be a part of a church anyway. And mm-hmm. Grow in that so was there a certain point in time when you came to understand the gospel yes it would be for me it'd be ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 okay for, the, for some reason that sticks out it says for by grace are you saved through faith and unto good works and for some reason that sticks out to me but it's one of the like the key moments where i was like man you can know but it wasn't there that says you can know. i'm trying to think of where it says I've told you these things that you may know, that you will know you have eternal life. Yeah. That, that's the one. I think it's First John. John 5. Yeah. Because that's when I got to share with my dad. He ended up going to John 5.13. So, like, see, it doesn't say it. So I had a kind of look. First John. Yeah, so it's First John, and then I showed him it. But he only read one or two verses. Like, see, it says exactly what he thought it would say. But I'm like, did you read it, the context of it, just in German? But, well, no, he couldn't really read so I read the chapter for him, and he's like, well, I can't read. Hmm. <laughs> that was kind of funny. He would come out, out to say, like, well, I can't read after, like, showing him that he, he read, can know. read the couple of verses, but then anything more than that, he's like, no. Well, he was satisfied with what the word, what verses said. Just like the honor your mother and father, they stuck with just that. But it says honor your mo- father and mother in the Christian family. It's, it's de- designed towards the Christian family. The followers because mm-hmm. you can't honor your father and mother if they're out killing people or anything yeah like exactly so uh was it during a bible study do you think that you first kind of understood the gospel or what what drew you to that if you were kind of rebel from church you were married now from old colony but you you know you no longer wanted to live like a, a rough lifestyle but we didn't want our children to grow up so it was more it was a selfish ambition for our children but yeah a, a, a but, desire to see your children walk in we, truth we also wanted that too and I don't know if you know these the, the the Bible book stories, the blue ones. Yeah, yeah. You always see the pictures of the church with all colors of people just worshiping God. In my mind, that got branded in my mind. I I wanted something like that. I wanted that fellowship. Okay. That joy that you see in the picture, even. And Interesting. You don't get that. You get that shh at the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're calling so. Everybody looks the same. There's yeah. never any new people. Yeah. There's no converts. Because that's what drew, drew me to uh, Lighthouse was, there. What was it their love so they say good morning welcome and they made it a point to know my name like within the first two weeks or whatever yeah. it was which shocked me like nobody knows my name it's just I'm nobody surprised that yeah it surprised me that they took the time to get to know who was coming in the door mm-hmm. and that kind of set me in. and then also 
during the services, it just kept felt that I kept feeling like they were talking about me. Mm-hmm. So when they're doing their sermon, it's like, man, they looked up my history and they're talking about me again. <laughs> <laughs> so the conviction, I, I learned to enjoy it. I'm like, they're talking about me again. I want to feel that. Yeah. So it, it was very uh, humbling to, to feel that. And it's very hard to take the old self off. Because you're so stuck in your ruts, and you're like, no, this is the way it has to go. Mm-hmm. You're not willing to set down your baggage, in a sense. So, as a Christian believer, I'm trying to build myself out to be a part of like ministries and stuff, mm-hmm. which John Fair is a part of too, like the Men's Encounter even stuff. There, it, op- it showed me that we all we all want the same thing, and we could actually express what we wanted. Like to have that connection, fellowship with people, like a closer at fellowship. the men's encounter. Yeah. Okay. Did uh, you were saved before you went to the men's yeah. encounter? I was more like a, I would say, a spiritual dump because of the COVID thing. I had to look over through everything, look through all the conspiracies. So I was like spiritually drained. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like putting uh, booster cables on your body and putting you back to life. Okay. Uh, There's a lot of energy at those events, right? <laughs> Everybody's really excited and. Yeah, it's a lot of energy brought up for sure. Yeah. Um, the the idea of Ephesians chapter 2 there, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should yeah. boast. Uh, w- what is the gift to you? How did you come to see that gift? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like how to grab salvation for yeah. myself. Was there a point in time where you were like, ah, that's what I need to trust in. That's what I need to cling to. Well, it came to the point where I was like, there's nothing I can do to make me righteous. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, there's nothing right about me to earn salvation. Right. And I had to understand that God's creating like his own story. He's like, I created the humanity. They fell short. So he keeps reaching out of saving grace. So he mm-hmm. keeps saving the people. So I got Noah, he saved them there. So Jesus was the ultimate saving grace that we had. Right. So the, uh, it was a transition period. So the exact moment is is always tough to pinpoint. No, yeah, exactly. But I remember with clearness that it was like, whoa, I can't do nothing to earn to get into heaven. I have to trust that Jesus on the cross, he took my sin. Yeah. Like he is like, I have to walk through him to get into heaven. So Amen. He, it's, it was a shocker. It was like, all these time, all this time, you've been told that you can only hope, but then here is someone telling me is like, no, look, it says it in John, it says it in Mark, it says it, like it says it everywhere that Ephesians, Romans, Romans ten, I think is a big one too that mm-hmm. sticks out. I'm just not very good at remembering them, mm-hmm. which I try. <laughs> it's yeah, there's there's such beauty in that the simplicity of the fact that when when Christ was on the cross, he cried, it is finished. Yeah. And now the Bible says that we are baptized into his death yeah. so that when he died, we also died. When yeah. he was buried, we also were buried. When he was raised, we were raised. And so there's this substitutionary idea that he died as if he were me yeah. and he went down into the heart of the earth with my sins and he came back up without them. And now I get to go to heaven in his place yeah. along with him, right? There's that whole story of the Trojan horse back in the days of the city of Troy. Some people think it's a myth, right? But they couldn't get into this city. It was a walled city. They couldn't get in. So they finally built this big horse that they could give as a gift to the city. And inside the horse, the wooden horse, was a bunch of soldiers prepared, right? So they let this gift in, closed the gates behind it, and then the soldiers poured out and they were able to take the city. Now that's a negative way of attacking a place, but the only way you and I can enter into heaven is if we're in Christ. Yeah. And so we're hidden in Him. The Bible actually says that. Our life is hid with Christ in God so that we get into God's presence only through Jesus. But through Jesus, we are absolutely accepted. Like, it's not just barely. We're made saints. Yeah. That's a, that's a bold statement to make. Like, somebody like me to be made saints. It's like, yeah. I'm not worthy of that. <laughs> and that word saints is the same word as holy in yeah. the term Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, you know, holy Jake yeah. Holy damn. Like, really? Uh, that, that sounds too much, right? We don't feel worthy. And we're not. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's a gift. Yeah. That's something that he's done for us. And then for salvation, the understanding of it, I got 
show an example of somebody opening a pizza parlor okay. in your town. So they go hand out a free slice of pizza everywhere. Not everyone gets a piece, free slice of pizza. You have to actually go and redeem it. So basically, you have to trust that... You got a voucher. Yeah, you have to trust that Jesus dying on the cross, what he did was your payment for your, your sin, the sacrifice. Like, you have to accept that for yourself. Then you got to go take that voucher to God and say, God, this is what I'm trusting yeah, in. Here's, here's you're the... cloaked with Jesus' righteousness. Yeah. So. Amen. So that uh, the study through the book of Ephesians and all that with the patents, that was quite helpful in that regard. It was quite you helpful. You see the, the gospel more clearly? Yeah. We did uh, Ephesians. I think we did Corinthians, Romans. Wow. And we did Peter, I think, John. We did quite a few of them. That's a number of years that you were doing that. Yeah. Then. Yeah, eight years. And how many children do you have now? I have three. We had uh, one miscarriage and one atopic pregnancy, so mm. I could say five. Yeah. So you've had a couple scares then, yeah. some health conditions and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, they had to take put my wife out to remove it surgically. Wow. The tube, fallopian tube. Yep. Yeah. So that was scary. And this was after you were a Christian, though. Yeah. Yeah. But. After I was a Christian, but still not mature in my walk. Yeah. Well, I guess I still not. I was like, just going to say, are you mature now? <laughs> <laughs> but more mature than yeah, I was it, there. It, where and, you, at least now you have a joy and a confidence. Yeah. Uh, understanding, right? And that's really what it is. Uh, if you look at, at 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about through the knowledge of God, we have peace. But then we should add to that faith brotherly kindness and um, all those different things five or six different things that he mentions and then he comes back around to knowledge again so uh, by understanding who God is and what he's done through study of the scriptures yeah. Ephesians and Romans and all those books our joy becomes more complete and more full so we're saved as saved the day we trust Christ as we are 30 years later yeah. we don't get more saved no. but we do grow in that grace yeah. and understanding and that's kind of what the scriptures are for, is to teach us who God is. Yeah, and because we have obtained that knowledge, our will should be to pass that knowledge further. Mm -hmm. But like, look where you're going. It's like a cliff. It's like, you're heading for a cliff. You need to turn around. Yeah. It's the same idea. It's like, I don't want you to die. I care for you. Yeah. It's hard to bring across to some people, though. But. For sure. So for yourself, what do you say would probably be like the, the most monumental change, monumental shift in your life when you came to faith? Before you were an angry, sullen, kind of stubborn boy. You know? I would attack very easy. So I thought everyone was out to get me always. Yeah. But now I can, I can produce love. I should show people that I love them. I care for them. Mm -hmm. So that's not me. I've never done that. But uh, Pete Hebert's brother, Abe, I worked with him for a long time. And his mission was for me to say, I love him back. Is that right? It, it took him three years, I think. But and he would say, love your brother or something like yeah, that? Or what? Yeah, it's like, hey, Jake, I love you. And I would say, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell another guy I love yeah. him. I get to pass that blessing on to other people now, so. Yeah. I have joy in it. Nice. <laughs> Some people don't get, yeah. like it or they're uncomfortable, but. But, but even, tell even something as simple as telling your kids that I love you, you know, yeah. that's. It's pretty impactful to some people. A lot of times there's men that had very hard fathers or hard upbringing. When they understand the concept that God loves them, it's what, and it is, is called their father. Sometimes that's what is their breaking point where it's like a father that says he loves me and that actually shows yeah. me love. Like, yeah, we never got the I love you. We got, what if I go to send you goat? Yeah, uh, you should know. Yeah, you should know better. That's right. Uh, that's basically it. Or, or simple, and, and there's, there is some truth to that. Like if, if your dad wakes up every day and goes to work and comes home and makes sure there's food on the table, that is a kind of love. It's a form of love. Yeah. It's, it's a w love of action, but not a verbal love. Yeah. And so a lot of our ancestors and our forefathers didn't know how to say those things. Like, should I say it? Well, no, they should know. Yeah. Look what I did. They should know. Yeah. And our, same with our wives. Sometimes we think, well, why do I need to tell you every day? I told you once already. Like, what's going on here, right? Well, I'm good. If I change that. my mind, I'll let you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for that same before. No, you think your wife should know if you're discontent with something, and yet we're too stubborn to want to tell them why we're discontent. It's a struggle of mine. Yeah. So instead, I let a frustration build up in me. Exactly. When I could easily tell her, it's like, hey, this is bothering me. It's like, we need to do something with it. Like, can we talk about it? Yeah. And I'm growing in that area too. Like, I'm very closed off. My wife just as much, but 
Mm-hmm. We're learning to talk things over and talk yeah. things through. Well, that's, I mean, the Bible uh, speaks very highly of the idea of n- learning Christ through the scriptures, right? So yeah. as, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you mm-hmm. may grow thereby, yeah. right? And so why do we need to hear the word again and again and again? Peter, a same guy who wrote that, says that uh, we should, he, he says, I know you know this, but I want to remind you again. Yeah. You know, why do we need to hear that? Because we need to hear from our Father yeah, you're a miserable failure, but I love you. Yeah. I love you in spite of your failure, and I love you regardless of what happens. And so we should take that same thing and tell people regularly, the people that are close to us, especially our wives and our children, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. I care yeah, for you. Exactly. Well, that's another thing that stuck out. It's like, I love you. I loved you when you were in your deepest, darkest sin. Yeah. I love you just as much now as I did then. Yeah. To, to think of that, it's overpowering, overwhelming yeah. feeling. That he loved me even when I was in my darkest. When I while, thought I was while we were the ungodly, while yeah. we were his enemies, yeah. his love for us is un- unwavering. And it's only when you see that in your own life that you can then now translate that to other people. Like you said, for your dad, you could now look at him towards the end and say, "The guy is struggling. I, I, I want to have mercy on him because I know, you know, I was handed the same things he was handed. Yeah. I was a miserable failure, and so how can I have anything but grace and mercy towards him?" They always call it a generational curse, like anger stuff or whatever. You, you come from the father or drinking or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's a generational curse. I think it's just absence of God in your life. Because if you put Christ in your life, all that would fall away. You focus on Christ, all your failures kind of start diminishing and going away. Because mm-hmm. I always looked at my sin and like, oh, I can't do this. I need to fix this. And my brother recommended to me, he's like, or said, like, you need to look at Christ. Yeah. Stop looking at your failures, shortcomings, because there's an abundance of that. That's right. Like, look to Christ, what he's done already. Yeah. There is something about, like, we, we were breeding dogs for a while, and, you know, border collies, you don't ever have to teach them mm-hmm. to chase animals. They just know you got to chase animals. Yeah. That's what they're bred to do. So there is something about that where genetically you are predisposed to uh, have the same drives and the same struggles maybe that your parents had. Yeah. There's something genetically obvious about that. Like I have the same tendencies as my parents. I, mm-hmm. My ability to speak comes from my mom. Like she was quick to, to be able to put sentences together. And that's, yeah. that's just genetic. There's nothing I could have done differently. Yeah. But if you think about a curse, a curse is something, if, if that's the case, if we're going to talk about genetic or uh, generational curses, what happened to me at the cross? Well, I was put to death with Christ. Yeah. Do you think that one of the generational curses followed Jesus down into the grave they, and then came back up? They and can't. Now it's, no. Uh, it washes you of all sin. Yeah, and if you have a tendency toward a certain sin, that's where the book of Romans chapter 6 talks about, well, reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin. Yeah. Are you, were you crucified with Christ or were you not? Exactly. You know, Are you free from that or not? Yeah, like you can't have one uh, foot on one side and one on the other. Yeah. Like, so though you might have a tendency to want to do something, if you reckon God's truth to be true over your own, there is absolute victory over all yeah. your tendencies and all your drives. It's, through stubborn minds, it takes longer to grasp sometimes. Yeah. But then also sometimes that stubborn mind can fixate on what is true and right and say, no, it's Christ, it's Christ only, and nothing's ever going to change me from that. Yeah. I'm stuck on that. Yeah. Oh, God, God keeps placing people in my life to build and lift me up and encourage me because mm-hmm. by myself, I think I would very easily want to falter. But he keeps saying, like, look, these guys are struggling too. These guys are in the faith. They, look, look at their joy. And I feel like our calling is to show the joy of Christ in our lives too mm-hmm. that we have. Like uh, Before the, well, I guess in the early stages of be, having salvation, I always thought there's enough junk in people's lives that they don't need mine too yet. So it was a changing mindset. So like you didn't want to share with people yeah. what was on your mind. Yeah. So it kind of bottled things up too. Yeah. I got forced into anger management because of the incident with the guy. So I got learned. If somebody affects you, direct, directly talk to that person right away. Because mm-hmm. if you bottle it up, eventually it'll be something very dumb and you'll just explodes. unload on them. Yeah. And you'll get in very big trouble. So interesting. Sometimes people want to excuse their anger like that, though. Like, oh, I didn't mean to. It just happened. And, you know. Well, what was inside your heart just came out. So yeah. you were covering it up pretty good until that moment. So it doesn't make you justified, no. right? You're, you're, God knows your heart. Yeah. It doesn't matter if I don't see it. God knows it. So 
I yeah. take that to heart. <laughs> yeah. So now you've been married for 10 years, you said? Yeah. And uh, three children. Where, uh, what do you see happening in the future now? You were involved with the Men's Encounter, and uh, how about with those other events, the uh, Revive and Thrive ones? Did you go to those at all? I have never gone to those. Okay. I, I, when I was younger, I went to a Promise Keepers. Okay. That really opened my eyes up to how much people, how many people can come together and worship God. Yeah. It's a little overboard for me there, but it was freeing to see that there's a guy sitting beside me. He's like, you knew about God all your life? Like he is in his mid thirties or forties. Yeah. He never heard about God, so he thought it was he was in awe that we had heard about who God is, who Jesus is, our mm-hmm. whole lives. But he, I guess he doesn't understand. But that that, that kind of opens your mind to the idea that all nations, all races, all people, they all need to hear the truth, and yeah. they can all worship God the same way, right? Mm-hmm. Where the Mennonites often have this mindset that uh, we're the only ones there. If anybody else makes it into heaven, it's they became a Mennonite, maybe, right? Yeah. Uh, it, that's just imprinted in, in us. Nobody directly said no, it. No, really. exactly. Yeah. It got imprinted in us, and we're like, "Yeah, this is. We are the Jews." Like, no, we are technically the Gentiles. Yeah, exactly. It's a good thing the Jews kind of uh, shoved Jesus to the side, and Jesus for our sake. Yeah, yeah, for our sake. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot of joy for that, and I forgot what I was gonna say with the yeah, no. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> No, that's good. Your oldest child is uh, eight or nine, something like that? Eight. Eight years old? She's seven turning eight, sorry. Okay. April, she'll turn eight. Yeah. And you find your relationship to them already is a lot different than what it would have been with you and your dad? Better, but it started off on the same, very dangerous same path. Really? With discipline, because that's what all I knew, like discipline. So if they were acting out, you'd correct their behavior with discipline, but when you're doing it out of anger you're not disciplining them anymore. no that's abusive. now you're abusing them yeah so i had to r- r- basically change a gear in my head mm-hmm. and realize that you have to come out of love you have to say why are you doing this yeah and like you know we have to discipline you for what your actions are like we can't have this going on interesting so um some people when they were raised in a very disciplinary home they allow that to control the rest of their life. And what I mean by that is that sometimes they'll do exactly what their parents did without ever thinking, so it controls their whole life. Other times, they hated it so much that they react and do the exact opposite, and they never discipline their children. Yeah. And that's that's still controlling their whole life, right? They're still only doing what they were taught or doing the exact opposite of what they were taught rather than doing the truth. And so discipline has to happen immediately, and it has to have consequences. Yeah. But it's all out of love and there's never anger associated yeah. with it, right? So, you know, I've, I've disciplined my children repeatedly through the years, but it's never been out of uh, a snapping. Or it should, should never be out of it snapping, be, right? Yeah. It's always out of, like, no, we're going to deliberately take care of this and we're going to hug it out and we're yeah. good to go. Yeah. And it's amazing. Often after, like, some pretty strict discipline, they can come to you and just feel closer to you yeah. than they have in a long time because they they know that this is the, this is the person who's actually keeping my life under control yeah. and well they still feel the father's love because you didn't un- explode on them yeah my cousin's always saying like if you're angry at your kids go for a walk like yeah. don't say nothing like you're better off going for a walk come back when you're cooled off yeah yeah and then it'll be harder for you to discipline them for them they will come accept it already that's right i heard a preacher once say years ago he said sometimes people will come to him and say you know i've just been really struggling at yelling with my or struggling with yelling at my kids and stuff and he's like excuse me He's like, that's like you coming to me as a Christian brother saying, yeah, I'm really struggling with cheating on my wife. And you, you want me just to accept that? You want me just to be like, oh, it's okay, brother. We yeah. all struggle. No. no I was like, Don't ever do it again. Turn from it. Don't ever yell at your kids again. Like, yeah. it's never acceptable, right? Yeah. I have a loud voice, so mine sounds like you're yelling at me. Hey. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's, like, again, we don't ever want to excuse our sin. But the fact that you guys couldn't hear well and that everything had to be raised to a higher level, mm-hmm. it can also chemically induce more frustration and anger right where people aren't listening and you have to raise so it could lead to a lot of that frustration well i was to the point where i couldn't hear well i was withdrawing from society already i'm like i can't hear nothing i don't want to be part of it like really? pointless. i learned to talk quieter because of the hearing aids now nice so there's a blessing behind it <laughs> yeah for sure so. nice there you go so what are you doing as far as getting involved and in, uh, reaching out and sharing the gospel so there's a we do a testimony night on Mondays, every okay. Monday, which uh, the coyote owner, John Clausen, mm-hmm. leads it. So we do that, 
and quite a few people come out to that from time to time, eh? Yeah, I, I, I wear controversial shirts, but apparently I'm a big boy. People don't like talk, uh, are intimidated to talk to me. Okay. So they have to see that I'm not as serious as I look. <laughs> yeah. I get that sometimes too. Yeah. So I have to learn. I had to learn how to smile. I was always a frown kind of person. It took for a long time, but I had to learn to have joy to smile. Okay. Because it's so easy to just rest and. But apparently it takes my energy to have the frown that does it, smile. Yeah, it does for so. sure. And uh, some people say that, you know, I, I've got the joy of the Lord. I just, uh, you know, joy is inside. But if it's on the inside, it's it going to come, come out, out. sometime yeah. too, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to go walking around smiling like an idiot all day. But, no. uh, but if there's joy and genuine Take pleasure happiness. in little things. Yeah. Open the door or somebody say, no, you're welcome. Like, have a nice no day. No problem, yeah. Yeah. And having that eye calm contact I used to never be able to do it really which it had to do with the upbringing I think so you always feel intimidated to look in people's eyes yeah with, with while conversation because the, eye, the eyes are the window to the yeah. soul right so I've learned to do that with people out in the everyday life yeah people and they talk to you easier when you're actually talking Absolutely. because like you have my attention it's like so I had to learn that too <laughs> yeah my wife is really big on that. We've got one boy now who's gotten to this weird habit where when he looks at you, he'll do this. And he's just like, she's like, no, 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 I'm not over there. I'm right here. But I think there's something in him where he's struggling or he's just built a bad habit. And she's like, every time, nope, look at me, look at me, look at me. And hopefully it'll force that habit where I want my children to be able to re go greet people, look in their eyes, yeah. shake their hand. Yeah. And I just read that verse in the book of Luke to them the other day where it talks about um, the eye is the, the light of the body is the eye. Mm -hmm. And if the eye be darkness, how great is that darkness, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we should have, and I, I, to me, it feels like it's a, it's a testimony for you to think, you know, you were raised an angry, sullen, you know, uh, high-tempered kind of mm -hmm. kid uh, that couldn't look at people and was retreating from the world. Mm -hmm. Now you're open to seeing people. You're looking in their faces. Mm -hmm. You're being gentle with your children. You're disciplining them out of love and care. And you can actually look people in the eye. Like, what is that but a miracle, right? Like, well, that's what I said. If God can work the miracle in my life, like, who can He help? Yeah. That's that's why the testimony is so great because nobody can take it away from me. It's what happened in my life. Yeah. I was on a dark path. Like, I guarantee you, if I kept that path, my wife would have left me because who wants to be with an angry grump? Exactly. So, I had to change. I had. Not it, for myself. Well, I mean, sometimes God allows you to use some selfish motives, right? Where I'm going to lose everything. Like John Fair, too. He was on the brink of losing his wife and his children again, right? And he thought, this is it. This is my last chance. And God allows, you know, he allows that kind of motivation. Like, yeah. you want your life to be better? You can, but ultimately it comes through recognizing it's not about you. It's about yeah. Christ. And you got to put the effort in, in doing that. You can't just, oh, yes, I want the change and then just go back to your normal ways. Mm -hmm. You got to put the effort in to, like, change your mind. Amen. So, so the uh, Monday night testimony nights, you get your part of that. You've shared your testimony there. Yeah. And you hear other people and just kind of interact with them there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it was designed, I think, for the youth and stuff. But there's a lot of us middle aged. I guess we call ourselves middle aged already. Yeah. Don't feel it, but yeah, I hear there's a lot of us middle aged there already. So yeah, yeah, we have a lot of interesting dialect. So we do um, a devotional type of thing before the testimony. Yep. And then we have a lot How of many people come out to that? It's on average like 30 already. 30 yeah. plus people sometimes. Yeah. Where is it? Is it typically at the Coyote restaurant? No, it's here, there, somewhere okay. else. Okay. So if uh, some other young people or middle-aged people <laughs> <laughs> wanted to come out, it's they're open to that? Yeah, it's for anybody. And it's every Monday? It's every other Monday. Every so other it would be... This coming Monday, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this coming Monday. Yeah, I think we need more of that. I've definitely considered at some point in the future maybe to start a men's type of ministry too yeah. where we inspire men to, to lean on Christ, obviously, yeah. but allow them to be men. You know, where our world right now is frowning on the idea of masculinity yeah, and mean? being strong and yeah. uh, courageous, right? Where I think we need more encouragement. to. Yeah. And then the other thing we do is we started a Bible study. So as a family with uh, three other couples yeah so it just kind of happened about my one friend is like hey are you involved in Bible study would you want to be a part of a Bible study so yeah I'm not quite sure who leads it but it just you just kind of go there and there's three uh, there's four of us couples and which we, book are you going through now 
we went through act. We're going through acts. Okay. So I thought it'd be interesting for me, but I guess some people haven't read as much as I have, so it can be tough in its own sense. Yeah. Oh, there's some difficult passages there. Yeah. But it is very encouraging. Yeah. For sure. Was it? There's something in chapter two that, to, like I said, I read it and I forget it, and that's why I need to keep read the chapter. And next day, read the same one again, just yeah, so yeah. I learn to remember. It does a lot of good to just reread. Like if you can reread the whole book, especially you say you look at the book of Ephesians or Colossians, they're pretty short books, yeah. and you could literally read the whole book every day for a month sometimes, yeah. and then start narrowing down. Okay, now what does this chapter say, or what does this one sentence say? Now I know where this verse fits because I know what chapter 1, 2, and 3 are about. Yeah. So what is this verse actually saying, right? Until you know the full flow of the context, it's hard to really put those verses in the right places. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more or less focused on the New Testament. Yeah. But I do like going to Proverbs or even Psalms sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Like, or with, is it Psalms or Solomon says, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But That's to Ecclesiastes. Know the book, right? That one sticks in my head. Yeah. Like, all this materialistic stuff, it's vanity. Like, but to know the Lord is vanity, and it, we should live in that light. Yeah, for sure. So, right on. Was there anything else you wanted to make sure we touched on, or did we think kind of cover the whole story? I think we covered the whole story pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Cool. Hey, our camera kept working. It's awesome. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Appreciate it, Jake. Yeah.